presentation by the students. Uh, Jennifer or Mike, do you want to start us off with anything or should we go right to Elizabeth? Please go uh, right to Elizabeth. Yes, that sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, looking forward to this presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, so, my name is Elizabeth K. Marchetti. I'm a senior planner with the City of Littleton, and I am really excited to be here tonight uh, with fellow staffer Shane Roberts and our two spectacular CU Denver uh, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning students. Um, this is the second year that the City of Littleton has taken up the offer from the CU School, CU Denver, I should say, School of Architecture and Planning's offer to present uh, capstone project ideas to their uh, students, their graduate students. Uh, a capstone project is one of the final steps taken, uh, final work products, work efforts uh, accomplished by master's candidates. Uh, and they engage with their clients, uh, willing local governments in the metro area uh, to complete a research effort uh, that culminates in some kind of final uh, design, some kind of final policy or regulatory, regulatory recommendation for use by uh, the, the city who's lucky enough to have attracted students to uh, for all free uh, to explore these subjects and develop um, these final products that that we get to learn from. Uh, not only is it a great educational opportunity, we think, we hope for these students, but uh, we as staff certainly um, treat these as educational experiences for ourselves. Um, we feel really lucky that we have this opportunity that we continue to reinforce this relationship between the city of Littleton's planning staff and public works and engineering staff and the CU School of Architecture and Planning. It's a, it's a really important part, we think, of, of reinforcing the values as established in the comp plan around uh, a connected and engaged uh, and anchored community. Um, so without further ado, uh, like, like I said, we are thrilled to be here. Really happy to have this opportunity. I'm gonna hand it off to Shane Roberts, who's gonna go into more detail on uh, the nitty gritty of this project. And then we will hear from our two fantastic students. So thank you. And if I may, I wonder, would it benefit you guys for us to introduce ourselves to? And to By all means, by all means, please, please. Um, for the benefit of, of the students, uh, I think if we could just real quickly go around. Uh, my name is Craig Coronado. I am a landscape architect and we're all um, uh, volunteers as members of the planning commission. We've signed up to serve our community and um, and we really appreciate what uh, what you've you've done. We're really interested to hear what you have to say, but go ahead and pass it along to Sherry and uh, everybody would just briefly introduce themselves. I am Sherry Almond. I um, have a long history in local government. And then after that, I uh, joined my husband in our uh, sports field design company, where we both uh, run that business, hopefully not ne needing Dave's assistance <laughs> with that. Anyway, um, and thank you for being here tonight. We really appreciate your work. Bruce, you want to go next? Yeah, hello, welcome, and thanks again, as everyone else has indicated, really appreciate you folks giving us the benefit of your uh, your work effort here. My day job is uh, I'm the finance team lead, if you will, for ARC thrift stores. Uh, so uh, we've got 30, 30 stores across the state and, and Ballpark, 1,500 employees. So it's uh, it it keeps me busy when I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Bruce. How about you, Dan? Hey, uh, Dan Miller. Uh, I'm an architect uh, with uh, Oz Architecture in Denver. Uh, design principal there. Um, and uh, I tell you what, it was fun to uh, the students last year that presented. It was really cool. Some fresh ideas. Remember, it was like on. Um, turning some of the parking spaces uh, on Main Street uh, into, you know, some outdoor eating areas. And it seems like we saw some of that uh, occur uh, on our Main Street program uh, over, well, due to COVID. So 
it was a cool presentation. We look forward to your presentation this evening. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Bezat? Yeah, uh, I'm Bezat Mirzai. I'm a professional engineer in Colorado and 20 some odd state. I practice structural and environmental engineering, do a lot of refinery and mining. Uh, Used to do a lot of um, development in Colorado. Highlands <laughs> Ranch was Jack G. Rob was one of my project. Uh, I've worked on DIA uh, structure uh, as a structural engineer. Uh, now I run my own company. It's a consulting firm in Littleton. I lived in Littleton for last 45 years, but I travel all over and I appreciate all the staff. Uh, working very hard on planning that they have done through the years. Uh, for the students, my son also graduated from CU Denver Architectural School with master about two years ago. So uh, I have a lot of connection to CU Denver and I used to be guest professor there off and on. So I appreciate you guys presenting and I hope to learn something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bezad. How about Jason? Hi, uh, Jason Reynolds. I've lived in Littleton for about 16 years now, and I work as a planner for Arapahoe County, the county in which Littleton is. Uh, however, we only deal with the zoning and subdivision for the unincorporated areas of the county. So my day job, I deal with unincorporated, and my volunteer uh, work, I deal with the incorporated areas of Littleton. All right, thanks, Jason. David Bolt? Hey, uh, Jason, don't forget that you, I, I live in a little sliver of Jefferson County that has the city in it as well. <laughs> uh, my name is Dave Bolt, and uh, I've been on this uh, planning commission, I think, since 2012 or 13, something like that. And uh, I think this is my last year before I have to, they boot me off. <laughs> uh, I'm in commercial real estate finance. and. Um, in uh i've lived in littleton for 20 years i think something like that so anyway thanks for being here and i uh, look forward to your presentation i think and last but not least our newest member of the planning commission dave mcfadden you need to put your um uh, mute take your mute off Sorry about that. Thank you, Craig. Uh, so um, I'm Dave McFadden. I'm a business coach. I've lived in the city of Littleton for about uh, 27 years, uh, originally from Philadelphia. And I have a long background in business, um, owning companies, selling companies, uh, things like that. And I'm uh, like uh, just brand new to the commission and very excited to contribute and really excited to hear your presentation today. And I appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Hey, Shane, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, and just for everyone here, I'm Shane Roberts. I'm a transportation planner in the public works side of things. Uh, but as Elizabeth said, so um, every year the university gives this opportunity for capstone students to kind of um, work with clients, as they say, and, and do a project. And so the project that Aiden and Krista will be presenting on is a bikeway design guide. And so where this comes from is you're probably familiar that the city recently completed a transportation master plan. And in that transportation master plan, um, you know, the plan lays out uh, how we can connect existing bike facilities and then what those bike facilities should be in a large picture, but it doesn't get down into the details. And so when this opportunity came uh, for the capstone project, we thought that uh, diving down into that next level of what do bike facilities look like in Littleton would be a good project for some students to look at and put a fresh set of eyes on. Uh, so we submitted that to the Capstone Project um, and Ada Johan, or Aiden Johan and Krista Runchy, um, they, both, uh, they both signed up for our project and we're very happy to have them, they're very bright students. Um, <clears throat> but they're both in the, the MERT program. And so we sat down kind of at the end of last year, beginning of this year and uh, came up with a scope of work, what that would look like. And so I wanted to give you guys a quick overview of that scope so you know a little bit about what they'll be presenting on. Um, so they'll start by looking at, they started by looking at some case studies from other jurisdictions, both from uh, around the nation, as well as in the state of Colorado, to determine what's the best practice when it comes to bike facilities. Um, you know, even though there might be a buffered bike lane or a protected bike lane, uh, what is really the safest bike facility? 
Um, and how does that encourage people to bike? Because not only do we want to have good bike infrastructure, but we also want to encourage people to actually use it. Um, so they looked at that. Uh, then they did their, they did some analysis of existing right of way and curb to curb widths because the reality is in the city of Littleton, um, when we're putting in new bike infrastructure, what we typically do is is pile that on top of an opportunity. So when we're repaving the street, we come in and see if we can uh, reallocate that space to put in a bike facility. And, and most of the time, we're not coming in and reconstructing the street. So we we did put that boundary on the project to kind of look at the existing uh, curb to curb, excuse me curb to curb width and see what bike facilities will, will fit in there. Um, and then finally, they're gonna recommend some uh, potential facility design as well as uh, prioritize for us. Cause that was one of the things we asked is, you know, we've got uh, a, lot of, a lot of opportunities this upcoming year to implement bike infrastructure. And so we would love for somebody to take a look and tell us, hey, these, you know, three to five uh, corridors should be your priority for, for putting in bike infrastructure. Um, and so one last note before they get started is, even though we asked them, um, we put some bounds on their project, for ex example, the curb to curb width, we wanted them to kind of be bounded by that reality. Um, we intentionally didn't tell them some things uh, in order for them to put in a fresh look. So for example, if there's any uh, political hot button issues, parking is always a good one. We didn't say, hey, you, you know, parking is off limits. We said to put a fresh set of eyes on this issue um, and come up with something that's really fantastic. And so that's just an overview of, of the conversations we've had. So hopefully you guys are all on the same page with us and with the students. Uh, and with that, I will kick it over to them and please introduce yourself and let's get started. Yeah, so just as a quick introduction, my name is Krista. I'm in the final year of the MERT program. So I'm graduating this week, I guess. And um, once I graduate, I will be working as a full-time transportation planner at Aaron Beers. Hi everyone, my name is Aiden. Um, I am also in the MERT program, but a little bit longer to my graduation, not until December, so I got a little bit of extra time. Um, and I currently work for Boulder County in their multimodal transportation department. I'm going to get my screen shared with you all. Let just one second and let me know when you can see it. There it is. Perfect. Now I'll hand over to Krista. All right, so again, my name is Krista and I'm presenting with Aiden and we are presenting our University of Colorado MERP program 2021 capstone on the city of Littleton's bikeway design guide. And so just a brief overview of how the presentation will look tonight. We'll first go over the project context, which Shane already partially went over in the schedule um, that we've taken throughout the semester. Then we'll go through some of our background research, which included case studies and best practice models we looked at. And then we'll also go into our own methodology and the classification system or typologies we came up with, which will be followed by our recommendations and then some concluding remarks. And so just as a very brief context, um, we were tasked with analyzing the existing city's transportation master plan or TMP. And so we also researched case studies and best practices as well as existing bike guidelines to help inform the recommendations we would eventually make. And so we used these findings as well as our own analyses to determine typologies. And these are basically, you'll see a chart. So you can essentially look at a street of your choosing and then be able to sort it into a different class. And then that class will have its own set of recommendations. So to create this, we chose some study corridors and then we developed these types apologies and group streets together. And then we also made citywide recommendations were provided. And so just briefly, this is how our schedule looked over the semester. So as you can see, we are on the very final end of it, which is satisfying, um, but it included a lot of research as well as our meetings with Shane and Elizabeth who acted as our clients and we also went on several site visits in Littleton and just went through the whole process from beginning to end. Before we made any recommendations to the city of Littleton, we wanted to make sure that we had a good understanding of what other municipalities, both in the state um, and from around the country, um, had done. So we selected six different guides that we looked at. Um, first, we looked at the Hillsboro Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is the county where Tampa, Florida is located. Uh, we picked it because it has the area has a very, fairly similar des, um, street design to Littleton. Um, and this guide was really helpful in thinking about how we wanted to lay out the report itself. They do a really good job balancing the needs of the three different audiences that will be reading the report, the general public, 
planning staff and engineering staff. We really tried to emulate some of the tools that they had used in that regard. We also looked at Fort Collins right here in Colorado. It's always very highly rated as a place to bike. Um, and their facility guidelines really emphasizes the transition point between two different facilities. You know, if that's going from a bike lane to a shared lane um, and how those can become potential conflict points between cyclists and vehicles. So we just want to make sure those are handled with care. Um, next, we looked at the city of Colorado Springs, also right here. Um, they did some really innovative things, like instead of just using the standard six feet for their bike lanes, they set some of their more popular bike lanes based on peak hour ridership. So the more riders there are, the wider that lane is. So that's really a pretty big departure and really shifting who has priority to that space um, away from the car and towards cyclists. That was an interesting thing that they have begun to explore. Um, we looked at the city of Burlington, Vermont, and their quick build design guide, something that Shane and Elizabeth um, had tasked us with, was coming up with both permanent solutions, but as, as well as um, less expensive solutions that could be done in the interim. So this quick build guide is really helpful and think about balancing the needs of durability um, along with the engineering cost to find that best fit. Uh, we also looked at the California Bicycle Coalition quick build um, guide, and they really helped us how we were thinking about it as an overall network and using those quick build interventions to um, connect small um, former disconnects to create a full network. And then lastly, the city of Cambridge's quick build prioritization process, which really applies a much heavier equity lens um, and making sure that projects are happening in different parts of the city, not all just focused in one particular area. From there, we selected a case study. Um, we selected Longmont, Colorado. Uh, in 2018, the city of Longmont did a pilot project where they tried three different types of bike interventions. They tried Shero, which is a shared lane markings um, indicating that a cyclist will be using the travel lane. They did a buffered bike lane, which is a standard five to six foot wide bike lane with a painted two to three foot buffer running along the side. And then they also did a protected bike lane. We'll be focusing on a protected bike lane. It was a long pike road, which is pretty similar, I think, like Prentice um, in Littleton, just you kind of an image of that. Um, they installed a protected bike lane along a half mile stretch of it for six months. Um, and upon the end of the, the pilot, they conducted a survey. Um, the first two interventions, the Shero and the buffered bike lanes, all received positive feedback, but the protected lane received some pushback from both drivers, which was somewhat to be expected due to the change, due to shrinking the lane a little bit, um, but also be, uh, negative feedback from both cyclists and maintenance staff. Um, maintenance staff felt that it was a little bit too narrow for their the plows and street sweepers they had on hand, so they struggled to keep it clear. Um, drivers felt as though the post obscured their vision and could be distracting, and cyclists felt as though they were too hemmed in between the um, separating posts and the curb. In the end, the city of Longmont decided a buffered bike lane was the right solution for the street, but from the process, the city of Littleton can really learn a lot. The lesson of this isn't that protected bike lanes aren't the solution. Um, the conclusion that we reached from it was that the city of Longmont, when they started the pilot and installed the lane, they didn't hold any sort of community education around why they were installing it and how it benefited all road users. Um, in the exit survey from the pilot, many cyclists stated that it was the first time they had used a facility like this and weren't sure how to approach it. And this is the main lesson for Littleton to take away. As they begin, as you all begin to implement some of the recommendations we've made in our plan, they may be first for many of the city's residents. So it's really imperative that there be an education component for all road users on how that facility um, is used. That will lead to much more successful imp implementation and less pushback um, from people who have never encountered that type of bike facility before. All right, and I'll go ahead and run through our methodology. So our methodology comprised primarily of spatial analysis. So we would do desktop analyses where we'd go into Google Earth or Google Maps, and we'd look at corridors and determine the amount of lanes they had, speed limits, as well as inter number of intersections, just overall ideas that will give us what the existing conditions and existing facilities look like. And then we also used a program mapping software called ArcGIS. And from there, I was able to measure right-of-way widths and also use other files to easily 
sorry, easily be able to look at um, existing bike facilities such as bicycle lanes and shared use paths. We also conducted two site visits and from there we were able to be on the ground and be able to see what different connections we might be able to come up with or what would be useful to better connect the city because primarily we went from a goal of connecting the existing bike facilities and finding ways where streets might not have anything but it'd be a great connector between what's already there. And so overall, we analyzed eight study corridors, and these study corridors weren't necessarily chosen based on priority or anything like that. They were just corridors that presented ideal connectivity from our analysis, and they were also all different enough to where we could create different classes um, to sort through them and come up with different recommendations based on what a corridor looks like. And so this is the chart that has our four typologies. So it ranges from fairly simple, which is typology one, to the most complex, which is typology four. And I'll be going into more details on what this all means in the next slide, but I'm so sorry. Um, but for these typologies, the factors that we looked at were the number of lanes in the road, the traffic volume, and the number of four-way intersections, connectivity, and the length of the corridor. And by connectivity, we mean connection to parks or employment centers, as well as connection to existing facilities. So a connectivity score of one may mean that it only connects to one existing facility, but a connectivity of four means that it's connecting to existing bike facilities. It also runs along a park or it might act as a connector to major employment centers or schools. And so this is the details of what each of the typology means. So as I said, the first typology is very simple. Um, it has a fairly narrow right of way, fewer intersections and lower connectivity, and typically also has very low speeds. And so Barry Avenue was an example of that. And then the second typology are the moderately complex corridors. So they have moderate right of way, they have a few more intersections, and they also have a little bit more traffic volume, and they also have existing accessibility. The majority of our corridors, um, four of them, did fall into this typology, but Detura Street's an example of that. And then the third class was complex corridors, and these have larger right-of-ways, they have several intersections, and they have higher traffic volume. And so Prentice Avenue is an example of this one, and it also borders a park. And then finally, the fourth one is the most complex corridors that have very high traffic volume. They have very complex right-of-way constraints, so these corridors might have bridge crossings or other infrastructure that might make it difficult to implement drastic bike facilities. And they're also typically arterial roads. So this would look like Federal Boulevard or Mineral Avenue or Littleton Boulevard. So from there, I'll walk you through the types of recommendations we made in the plan, and then I'll walk you through what those look like for Prentice Avenue. So first, um, the recommendations we made, um, Sharrows or shared lane markings, which are already present in the city of Littleton. Those are the um, those painted bike symbols, alerting drivers, the fact that um, bikes will be present in the lane. Uh, we did recommend that they should be used in conjunction with other traffic calming measures to create an inviting uh, and safe space for people to ride. Next, we have super sharrows. These use that same symbol, um, but now they add either dashed lines or green paint on either side and create the six foot wide space in the center of the lane that cyclists have priority to and a vehicle would yield to the cyclist um, until it's safe to go around them. Um, we have conventional bike lanes. They're five to six feet wide, running parallel to traffic. We have buffered bike lanes, that same five to six foot wide lane. Um, and then it has a two to three foot wide buffer, either on the outboard side, protecting the cyclist from traffic, or sometimes on the inboard side, protecting from parked cars, and especially car doors. Um, we have bike boxes. This is a painted green box that is in front of a stop bar at an intersection and it puts that cyclist out in front of the stopped car which has a couple advantages it gets them clear of a right turning vehicle um, and it also improves their sight lines so that if they are crossing or merging into another facility it reduces the likelihood of coming in uh, conflict with the vehicle next we have a cross bike this functions just like how a crosswalk would except a cyclist does not have to dismount how they are supposed to while using pedestrian crosswalk. Um, we have through bike lanes, which is a short strip of bike lanes that are used to get cyclists through um, complicated intersections. You most commonly encounter them when a bike lane has to cross over a right turn lane. 
Um, next, we have curb extensions, which is an addition to the curb and typically at an intersection that narrows the street, um, forcing traffic to slow down. Then the last two, we have protected bike lanes. Again, it's using that same um, kind of six foot or more wide lane, um, but it is bordered by protective posts or sometimes a parking lane can be used as that protective barrier. And then last, we have a two-stage turn queue. This is used for multi-lane um, roads, signalized intersections. So at a stoplight uh, where a cyclist is trying to turn left, they can go straight on that through lane and then they wait in the queue box to go straight then in the direction where they wanted to go left. And so it allows them to safely make a left turn on two light cycles instead of trying to cross over two lanes of traffic to reach the turn lane. So now I'll walk you through what one of our recommendations looks like. Um, this is just one of the corridors. The other seven are all the report in full detail. But for, today, for tonight, we'll just be looking at Prentice Avenue. Um, as you can see on the top there, it has parking along both sides, has roughly seven foot wide parking lanes, 11 foot wide travel lanes, and six foot sidewalks on each side of the street. Um, so for this section, uh, Prentice is a really important connection for the city because it connects to existing infrastructure along South Delaware Street and to the Centennial Link Trail on the west end. And it also provides an important bicycle connection to the Cornerstone Park, which is a really wonderful amenity for the city. However, due to that limited curb to curb distance, not wide enough to add bike lanes without removing parking, this was a corridor we weren't comfortable with making that recommendation due to that parking being really important to the park, especially for things like soccer tournaments, where that's heavily utilized, as well as for the residences that are along that stretch. So instead, due to the lower 30 mile an hour speed limit, um, this corridor would be a good fit for super sharrows. As I mentioned earlier, it uses that same shared lane marking, but with ideally that green paint to really emphasize that cyclists have priority to that space, or if cost um, of doing it that way is a barrier, you can do it in a more simple form with the dashed line pictured on the bottom there. But this provides cyclists with a dedicated six foot amount of space where vehicles would yield to them until it's safe to pass. So this is just one of the recommendations we've made. Like I said, the other corridors, um, you can read about in detail in the report. And so in conclusion, um, a commitment to optimal bike infrastructure is really key for allowing um, it to be safe for all residents to navigate the city um, by bicycle. The city has a really strong foundation, especially of multi-use trails. And so our report is really aimed at just making those smaller connections um, in between those existing facilities to allow the full network to flourish. Um, some of the key recommendations we have, we include both the optimal and best facility. Um, in the past example, that was that green paint. And then we also include a um, easier, quicker to build solution like the more simple design. So for each street, you know, as we want to make sure these recommendations could be built within the constraints of a city budget, so we provided an expensive, um, an optimal, and an effective but less expensive option for all of our streets. So thank you so much for the time and listening to our presentation. And thank you to Shane and Elizabeth for your support with our project. And you will have the full report come Thursday. And if you're interested, you can read through all of our recommendations there. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys so much. That was a great presentation. Um, do we want to? Does anybody have any questions, um, these folks? I have one, if that's OK. Um, yeah, go ahead, Dave. How, how, uh, how easy is it to get the word out to people what all the different symbols actually mean? You were talking a little bit before in the beginning that it, you've got to put the word out and all that. But does that include education on you know, what does that green bike line, you know, bike lane mean, you know, the dash lines, the boxes, things like that. Because again, I think a lot of that is new for Littleton. Just curious. Ideally, it would include that. Um, it cut, so prior to COVID, I taught bike education in Boulder. Um, and so the city contracted with the bike shop I was working at, and I would go into classes at some for schools, libraries, kind of community gathering places like that, where I walked people through 
um, how to bike to work, what the different types of symbology um, meant. And then each year, the shop I was working at, we would hold a ride where we would take people out to the new infrastructure um, and kind of show them where they were and um, how they work. That was the, that is the type of education I've had experience with um, in the past. But depending on the cycle, you know, if a lot of people are already biking or not in the city, it could look slightly different, I think, for Littleton. Thanks. Uh, Jason, you have your hand up. Um, yes, thank you for the presentation. And I, I'll look forward to using the Super Chero on my bicycle commute home from the tech center along uh, Prentice. Uh, one question I was wondering about is, uh, are there any concerns with uh, using like the the green paint and grip? Uh, does you know a painted bike lane uh, cause any issues with uh, with cycling maneuvers? It's probably not a huge issue in Colorado, or it's relatively dry. But just wondering if it's a day like today, does uh, you know paint across the whole lane create any potential issues? Not. To my knowledge or in my experience, um, I would say the one advantage. So I think if it's on a, a standard bike lane where it's on the side of the street where it's going to be in the shade more, I think it could potentially, I mean, there's always um, a safety concern with ice stuff in that instance. With it being down the center of the lane, in theory, it gets more sunlight, so that may eliminate that issue but in my experience i haven't found the green paint to be more slippery than say a like um concrete path and, and i can hop in too real quick jason um so we have on windermere we have some some green areas in the bike lane uh we wanted to do those much longer but we found that when we got our first quote back that for a mile of restriping it was six figures so we quickly shortened up that green thermo um, and when they lay down the thermo it's actually a big sheet that they heat up and they throw down um, what almost looks like uh, kind of some grip almost some like really tiny beads uh, to prevent that so yeah so we have had those concerns with the paint okay thank you um sherry i think you were next um, when you looked at, I'm curious about mineral, and when you took a look at mineral, um, there were already some changes made to the bike lanes down toward um, Jackass Hill and Santa Fe. And then, um, so I'm curious if you, A, had anything to input into that, or do you have different ideas about how that's being configured? So for mineral, um, we kind of used the transportation master plan as our guide for that. And so the transportation master plan had already recommended adding protected bike lanes to that. So we ran with that recommendation, um, which involved, we recommended that one of the lanes shrunk by one foot just to allow a little bit extra space for the bike. Then the other infrastructure change we made along there was adding some of those left turn cues that I spoke about earlier. Since it's two lanes, both directions, the big safety hazard for a cyclist to be crossing over those to reach those turn lanes. So we recommended use of two um, of those turn cues. Um, we chose mineral because it already had it aligned well with the transportation master plan, but those same recommendations would apply to any of those other streets that fit within that fourth typology. Okay. So the so you they had already chosen a protected lane. So Perhaps there's going to be some of those sticky uppy things along there. <laughs> yep, that was okay, probably. and then because I see a lot of, you know, I go that way a lot and turning on the jackass to go um, north. There, uh, cars always cut over into that bike lane, and I've seen uh, police officers there giving tickets like crazy for people cutting over there. It's really dangerous. So I was curious about that and. Um, the other question I have just about that particular area, there's, you know, there's a uh, paved, no, it's not paved, the dirt trail that's part of the high line kind of that follows mineral. And I often wonder why, you know, that's not just utilized for the bicycles rather than the street because, you know, it's so dangerous over there. And there's not a lot of foot traffic or anything on that particular piece between Jackass and, say, Windermere. I just wonder what your 
thoughts were on that. I, my personal thoughts on that as a rider, <laughs> as someone who rides my bike fairly frequently for commuting, I always find it, I would, I find it personally safer to be in the roadway in a safe manner. So in this case, in a protected lane than on a path where I'm potentially also dealing with pedestrians and more importantly, dog walkers think are, can be a really hazardous for riding. So personally, um, as a rider, I find it to be more comfortable in the lane. Uh, we, for that stretch, we chose the protected lane mostly because it was the recommended solution in the transportation master plan. I don't know, Shane, if you have other feedback on that. Yeah, so actually with that whole stretch of mineral from uh, just east of Santa Fe to Windermere, the city just won uh, $2 million. And so we actually have a, an RFQ out on the streets right now uh, to have a consultant come in and look at that. Um, so that that jackass and mineral intersection is actually our most dangerous for cyclists in terms of crashes. So they're going to come in and look at that, um, recommend safety changes, as well as how to upgrade that that bike lane um, along mineral and keep in keeping in, in mind things like maintenance, you know, if we have to, our, our plows right now are, are 12 foot wide blades. And so if you have a, a five or a six foot bike lane, it's kind of hard to get that thing in there if it's separated by curves. So, so more to come on, on mineral specifically. Uh, David, I think you had your hand up next. Uh, yeah. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I, I would point out that our former mayor uh, was hit while biking at that intersection at Jackass Hill and, and uh, Mineral. Um, although I think there were minor injuries still, that's pretty dangerous. And I'm glad to hear that somebody's seen police over there because I've never seen police over there and constantly see people you know, cutting into that lane. Um, and uh, just, uh, you guys probably know this already, but Lakewood has a lot of these lanes already, protected lanes, green paint. And uh, I biked over there quite a bit a few years ago and never had any trouble with any of the the uh, lanes, but they actually had on um, Yale, they had uh, some protected lanes with the, the plastic posts and they've since taken those down. I'm not sure why they did that, but my, my question, I guess, is did you guys talk to any municipalities that have uh, measures in place like that uh, directly or did you, just do, do your research online, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, um, we didn't consult with other municipalities or like face-to-face -face or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had heard of any, uh, any of an, uh, anybody who's actually done this, what their uh, experience is, uh, their practical experience. But, okay. Just through our case study research, not through direct interface with any okay. municipalities. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Hey, Dan. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask another question about this paint. Is there, I'm guessing that there's a uh, correlation of, um, I'm guessing the green paint is, is, is safer than the non green paint for those super charros. Is that, um, so yeah, no, I was just the, uh, the visual impact. I don't know if that's, a uh, of a concern that you, that you just sort of, it's just more, visual clutter on the street if you've got green paint and all the arrows i mean i get it it's supposed to be safer um I'm just curious about that um and you weren't supposed to look at any sort of uh ideas about any other additional east-west connections to the river at all where you i think we're limited to what maybe two or three you guys said you didn't look at any other uh ideas of how to uh extend to the extend the a bike network to the river at all. Take it. I mean, Prentice would be great if we could go across the river or the tracks. That wasn't in your scope. We didn't, and, mostly yeah. because of our mm -hmm. lack of expertise with, especially adding facilities along the bridges, um, just because of the capital that would be needed with those types of interventions. That was not something that we looked at um, as part of the report. Well, thanks for the presentation. Bruce? We know we've got in the city 
and you folks alluded to it, just the budget issues. And certainly some of the street infrastructure is not, shall we say, pristine. I wondered if there were any areas and maybe absent actually getting out and and being on the routes themselves, if you were able with Google Earth or whatnot to assess any of the conditions, the street conditions, such that if there were areas on major thoroughfares where the, the condition of the street warranted it, would would you theoretically ever detour somebody around a you know say a block north or south, east or west to to sort of skirt areas where the conditions of the street weren't conducive to biking in the first place, let alone, I mean, if you have sharrows and, and so forth and so on, I, I get that in protected bike lanes. But if the, uh, if the condition of the, the pavement is not all that great, is there anything you can do about that in terms of detouring folks or, or is just is, is what it is? Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think because that was out of our project scope, but I'm sort of thinking on the yeah. spot of options for that. So we didn't, yeah, we didn't look at that as part of our scope. Um, I mean, I suppose you could route to a street that has been paved more recently. My gut reaction would be just to not add infrastructure until the time when that street was resurfaced. So tying it to that maintenance schedule would be my gut instinct on that, but it wasn't something that we looked in. I don't know if you would have more input on that, Shane. Yeah, you know, and I'm trying to think, I can't think of any situations where we've laid down a bike lane and, and said that, well, you know, this this section of street is in too rough shape, so let's route, route bikes around it. Um, you know, in the cases where there's maybe one big pothole or one area, then we try to fix those to encourage biking. Right. Um, but yeah, and yeah, um, so we, we have a, a CIP dashboard that talks about all the pavement and stuff and, and which kind of areas of the city will be repaving and resurfacing and reconstructing. So um, so that's online on the city website for reference if anyone's curious. Uh, but no, I can't think of a time when we've when we've routed someone around a block. So. Okay. Well, as everyone else suggested, I thought it was a very comprehensive uh, presentation and a very nice uh, work product. So thank you for for all your efforts. Hey, I see Mike has his hand up. Um, he may be trying to do the same thing I'm about to do, which is to thank everyone. Mike, you wanna you wanna chime in, or are you about to say the same thing? Ooh, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Old Town Hall Art Center. <laughs> oh, so good, so good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Elizabeth, you were about to say the same thing I was about to say. So go ahead. All right. So unfortunately, this is a great conversation. We, again, um, are so grateful for your time to, to, to give to these students, you, the Planning Commission. Um, this is a fantastic experience for them. And, and I personally experience, um, appreciate all of your really excellent questions. Um, and, and we're going to have to move on. There's, a, there's quite an agenda tonight. And um, we need to let the students go and you all have some work to do still this evening. <laughs> so again, on behalf of Krista and Aiden and Shane, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you tonight. Yes, and, and I would have Krista and Aiden, thank you so much. Thank and I would you. just add on to that. If you guys have bike questions, any of you commissioners, feel free to email myself or Elizabeth and we can, we can answer those for you. So thank Happy you guys to. and great job, Aiden and Krista. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was fantastic. Thank you. That's great. Have a great night, everybody. You too. And congratulations on your graduation. Thank you. Good luck. Have a good night. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. Well, I think the next item on the agenda then is uh, Jennifer in uh, the downtown, um, downtown uh, zoning. Yeah, we actually, we, we changed the order a little bit. I hope you guys don't mind. We're going to uh, talk parking real quick first and then go into the downtown adjustments that, um, that we have uh, basically identified um, that need to be made um, now that we have some applications going through the downtown process. So let me share my screen. 
and we have Reed with us, so he'll tell me if I'm saying anything wrong. Right, Reed? <laughs> wrong. Wrong. Okay. All right. Well, we're done here. All right. Excellent. Hang on. Let me put it on slideshow. It may go to uh, it. A quick note. Uh, I will have my camera off for most of the meeting because I uh, lost my power co cord in the uh, council chambers. So I'm on battery. If I if I uh, if the battery gives out, I will call in. So we're going to have, we'll have Mike talk first, just, you know, so he can get it all in before his battery dies, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, as you know, we're, uh, we're, we are uh, continuing our discussion about ULUC topics, not the ULUC uh, specifically, but just some of the major topics that we're um, planning to work on with this ULUC. And there are several different directions we could possibly go on each of these topics, but uh, one of them is parking. And parking is one of the, the key aspects of land development in, in any city, including Littleton. Um, currently, we have minimum parking regulations. We're all used to these. You have a use, and uh, you are required to have a minimum number of parking spaces for that use. Um, there are some different ways to, uh, uh, for, and I think we've got an example here, um, uh, and it's all off street spaces for the most part. There are some exceptions in the downtown area, but for the most part, you know, uh, we have, a minimum number required offsite for each use. For example, a one and two and three family dwellings require uh, a minimum of two spaces per dwelling unit. And then multifamily dwellings uh, require a minimum of one and a half spaces for per dwelling unit. That's all fairly familiar. Um, there are certain alternatives that are available to us through the ULUC. We could talk about maximum parking requirements, and uh, you've probably seen this. Uh, you know, it's it's a more popular thought uh, today that um, rather than minimum parking requirements, uh, some cities are going to maximum parking requirements off street, and this might help um, conserve land for other uses possibly, and limit the overall number of parking spaces that, that are provided on a particular site. Uh, this is not uh, uh, uncontroversial in some regards, uh, when, particularly when you get to retail uses, uh, particularly restaurant uses, multifamily uses um, can have uh, some negative impacts associated with maximum parking spaces. There are municipalities around the country that have converted their minimum parking space requirements to maximum parking space requirements. Uh, so that's a, that's a concept that's out there. Uh, we could also uh, combine concepts and say, well, you have to have a certain number of minimum you know, you have to have a minimum number of spaces, but you can't go over a, a maximum number of spaces. Um, in our in the downtown regulations that were uh, adopted last year, we talked about parking credits and ways that um, landowners can mitigate the need for parking, and we can build that into the code. And we have built that into the downtown section. For example, um, and we have some of this in our, our existing code with bicycle parking spaces. Right now, you can, you can offset parking requirements through bicycle parking spaces up to, I believe it's 10%. So we have some of those concepts built into the code right now. But the downtown piece takes it a bit farther. Um, in the downtown area that, that uh, we adopted last year, 
if you're nearer to light rail, you can have a, a certain um, percentage of spaces reduced from your from your minimum required number. Uh, if you have uh, ride sharing uh, spaces, you may be able to reduce parking. If you have uh, on street uh, parking, you may be able to uh, reduce your minimum number required. If you have off site parking, you may be able to reduce that minimum number. So it's a way to provide some flexibility. Um, also, we, we currently employ shared parking agreements, mostly with, uh, with shopping centers and uses that are together on one site. And we've been doing that for several years as well. Uh, just wanted to kind of go over, you know, talk about some of these, uh, these parking concepts. And, and Jennifer, if you could move to the next slide, we can, uh, can kind of open it up for uh, commission discussion. And we just had some, uh, some maybe uh, thought-provoking questions, not necessarily that these are the only ones, but uh, you know, should we pr provide incentives for um, um, pervert, per if there were preferred methods of parking or preferred methods of transportation, the parking code can provide incentives for electric vehicles, for example, or structured parking, or uh, even multimodal transportation. Um, should parking incentives apply to all parts of the city, not just downtown? Should there be uh, a residential parking permit program downtown? We've, uh, we have had that in the past, and uh, uh, the police department handled it. Um, for many years, and we only have a few uh, uh, permit programs going, but uh, we suspended that program to um, wait for the ULUC to be adopted. And that's a, that's a discussion point we could talk about. But those are just a few areas uh, of, of discussion, and, and we'd like to send it back to the Planning Commission to kind of chat about this and see what your thoughts are on, on parking. Okay, that's a, a fraught issue, right? <laughs> um, sure is. <laughs> and I would say, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop sharing screens so we can see each other and I will take notes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I'm taking notes as well. Well, I'll just start and then I'll take uh, hands as we go around. I see Dan's already got his up, but um, uh, some of my thoughts uh, along these lines, um, and, and you see it played out in some of the development scenarios is, um, you know, in, in order to get um, a, a, a business district or a, a business area like our downtown area to uh, solve a, a problem like parking holistically, it seems like they need a, a third party partner. Um, and I know there's been some discussion of a, a downtown development authority or something along those lines as somebody that can take the risk of in, investing, investing in, in parking uh, off the, the shoulders of the businesses so they can do what they're, they're good at. Um, and so I think that third party partnership is, uh, is something that um, should should be supported in some way. I love the idea of incentive, incentivizing. That's the easiest way to, to sort of uh, implement the goals um, that uh, the council and staff have come up with for uh, both density and for walkability and for you know, safety and, and so on, um, uh, creating incentives. Um, um, it, it's probably the the easiest path short of having that sort of partner, uh, which will take a while to, to develop. Um, so Craig, if I can kind of tag on to that. So if you all turn in, uh, tune in tomorrow to city council's meeting, we're actually discussing goal four, which is downtown of the city council. And the exact concepts that you are talking about will be introduced um, tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. I know some, you know, Main Street, especially downtowns that have a historic character that they want to preserve. They've eliminated parking requirements altogether, uh, and I think we've we've moved in that direction. We're not quite there yet, but um, it certainly is, um, um, in my opinion, a direction we should be moving in. So, Dan. Uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I, I know our consultant, uh, Kendig Keast, has, has identified that we have certain parts of the the city that are auto oriented and mm -hmm. uh, so certainly support uh, uh, reducing parking uh, requirements uh, to to start to go away from that auto oriented character um, um, certainly support i mean so any of these incentives sound very interesting uh, electric cars uh, i'd be curious to know how you would incentivize uh, parking structures um, but certainly support reducing uh, parking demands adjacent to public transit. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's a cool idea to be able to, uh, if I provide uh, ride share spaces or uh, additional bike storage or whatnot, that, that's, that's a great incentive as well. I think, uh, um, you know, we do a lot of multifamily work uh, at where I work and, and um, you know, Fort Collins, uh, Denver, it just, it seems like developers are okay with this sort of uh, lower parking demand or requirement uh, and are okay with the minimum or maximum uh, parking requirements that some of the municipalities are um, imposing. Um, where we get, where we get stuck with or, or uh, office uses tend to be more sort of those developers want to bump up that parking count. So that that's sort of just the pattern that we see. You may have a you may have a a, a minimum, but they usually want to bump it up even more. So and that's just more of the market. Anyway, just some observations. But yeah, I, I think I definitely support reducing parking, uh, to make us less auto oriented. Bruce, I think you're up next, and then Jason. I agree, Craig and Dan, with what you're saying about the incentivizations. Uh, it seems that's the most effective way to encourage people to, to do what we'd like to see done. I do kind of think that the permitting arrangement for downtown residential on the street and whatnot has some merit uh, it just people who live down there should have some sense of you know some prioritization in terms of if they need to park on the street and not sure what the specific program was like but the other thing i wanted to inquire of and mike if you're still on or jennifer you know are there any state or federal grants hypothetically that we might avail ourselves of to start putting in infrastructure that might support electric vehicles uh, I, I mean if we had again i'm just speaking here hypothetically but if we've we use the city center as a parking lot for downtown activities it's a bit of a hike but honestly it's not that you know it's a few, couple blocks it's not that far and if you know we had charging stations set up in there that might be interesting uh few here or there around the downtown area kind of thing would be potentially interesting if we particularly if we could get some sort of a federal or state grant that might assist us or I don't know what other there's other groups like Energy Outreach Colorado does does stuff that is involved in reducing carbon footprints and this might might play to them as well. So I can tell you right now that actually as part of the city center remodel we are getting electric charging stations at the city center that will be available to the public. Yeah. Um so we will have those. I, I, I am not sure what the funding source was of that, um, but I do know that there are grants um, and even Tesla themselves um, are always looking for, for sites and partners. 
Um, so that is definitely something that we could look into. And I think that again goes to, you know, put it on the task list of the hopeful downtown development authority. Well, and, and if, you know, hypothetically, if Tesla is looking for partners, if they wanted to donate a few police cars, I'm sure that, you know, would, uh, that could be interesting. I think the police department would like that. They I'm, like extensive toys. I'm <laughs> kind of assuming so as well, but yes, <laughs> that's it. Okay, uh, Jason and then Bezos. Um, no, thanks for presenting this uh, topic to us. I think you, know, you mentioned in passing one of the things that's really underutilized, which is curbside parking and the potential for credits for that, especially in residential areas. I mean, I, I sort of question the need for the two spaces of off-street parking for a single-family residence, uh, given that you can provide that entire need on my block with the curbside parking and have several spaces to spare. Uh, nobody would even need to have a garage unless they wanted one to prevent hail damage. And I think, you know, there's some opportunities to look at reducing parking requirements in, in many areas. Given that our the ULUC is intended to be sensitive to context that might not be appropriate in the more far-flung neighborhoods that don't have access to trails, bike infrastructure, and transit like my neighborhood does. But, you know, the, the curbs are underutilized. Uh, I, someone mentioned multifamily, and I did a quick look at the aerial by the 5151 apartments there on Rio Grande, north of the city center, and there's about 31, it looks like-ish, on-street parking spaces in front of those apartments and uh, in the aerial 26 of those were used um, you know because when I lived in an apartment complex it was much easier to park on the street uh, than to spend an extra five minutes going over the speed humps and finding uh, somewhere inside the complex so you know people like street parking and they especially like using the street parking downtown because uh, we don't enforce uh, when the highest demand is. So it's very difficult to find a parking space after five o'clock on the weekends. We don't know how many of the folks who are working at the restaurants decide to roll in in that hour or two before uh, the parking restrictions expire. And if they're there at six o'clock, they're there until 2 a.m. Uh, occupying a space that could be turned over for folks who want to dine downtown. And I personally have used that strategy if I was going to spend a long evening downtown, uh, hogging a parking space all night. Um, so, you know, there's some things, particularly in the downtown context, where enforcement could be a factor or even, dare I say it, charging for those the privilege of parking there. Even places like Idaho Springs have started to charge for downtown parking when they never did before. They'll give you an hour free, but after that, you got to pay. So there's a lot of uh, parking tools we can use. And I think you'd find that even in the more auto-oriented areas, uh, minimum parking standards would sort of take care of themselves. Uh, if a shopping center were un decided to build and you know, build in a way that was somehow underparked or had too many restaurants in the mix, uh, they would, you know, fight to succeed in the marketplace. Or uh, perhaps the people who don't want to circle a lot looking for spaces to dine at the hot new restaurant in Littleton could find another spot to dine and send some business there. Um, you know, I do think, uh, you know, a lot of the options you've sh you showed on the slide are you now potential tools that could be used in the ULUC. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Besa? Yeah, uh, I have a, uh, <laughs> uh, basically, um, I don't understand what the objective of the whole maximum or minimum is. Is the city is trying to force people not to drive? Is that one of the objectives? Is it objective is to have more developable land to put more intensified building? Uh, so I think the question here is, if, if the objective is to reduce number of car or ownership of car or driving cars in certain areas of Littleton, we need to understand the impact. 
either to retail, restaurant, employees that work there, and also close proximity to transit. Not all the uh, people uh, that work downtown or they have retail or restaurant downtown can afford to take transit from different part of the Denver metro area is very hard because the transit system is not uh, um, like most of the bigger city like New York or um, London or Paris and so forth. So it's very difficult to take public transportation. So by passing this kind of law what, what, uh, or regulation or zoning requirements or whatever you want to call it, what is the impact to different uh, stakeholders? <laughs> and are those impact, have, uh, have you look at those impact and can enumerate and qualify and quantify those impact? Uh, as I said, um, when I came to the United States many, many years ago, the mentality of American is to drive car. And that mentality cannot be changed. Uh, I live by high school and from age 16, everybody drives car to high school. Nobody take the bus anymore. <laughs> So that's fact of life. So if you want to force it down throat of the people by pushing them to have certain restriction, that's going to backfire. I think the incentivization, um, maybe the businesses can issue car sharing credits and so forth, are more appropriate way to go. You don't take a big stick and hit people in the head with it. I think you try to educate, train, and also develop the better transit system. My um, biggest beef with the city is why we are not closing downtown Main Street, like Boulder did, like Denver did with Sixth Street, uh, and basically uh, uh, use, there are a lot of unused parking spaces, Arabo Community College. I had an office that overlooked that, 80% of the time during the day, that parking lot is empty. After hours, after six o'clock is empty. So why can't city come up with a plan to have a maybe sharing, maybe tolling with Arapo Community College, close the whole downtown area to traffic and let, let the retails and so forth thrive. Most of the city that they have done that, Sixth Street Mall, the Boulder Mall, all of them thrive. I was in Boulder when that uh, area was open to traffic. There, there, it was worse than downtown Lichterton. As soon as they changed that, the businesses thriving, the restaurant thriving, there is a lot of shows, arts in the middle of the street, and so forth. So that, that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Those are some good, good points, Beza. Um David, did you have your hand up? No, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I guess from from my perspective, um, with the limiting the the parking, you know, going from a minimum to a maximum, uh, my my thought is it's more of trying to right size the amount of pavement that's put, you know, off the streets because we have a certain amount of pavement in the right of way on the streets, um, and with the intent of um, providing more green space, um, providing more walkable communities that you're actually trying to reduce the amount of pavement that goes in the sites to just what people need and not anymore. Um, so I, I guess, it, you know, it depends on your perspective, but I think those are some important points that you brought up, uh, Beza, that, you know, what is the impact of in, imposing those types of changes? Um, I think there, there's two items that kind of popped out at me that um, we've discussed here about parking, but also in some of the development proposals we've seen, there's a negative perception of one thing, the curbside parking. Um, I know in some neighborhoods, especially those neighborhoods that have HOAs, I think some of them actually either discourage or maybe even prohibit curbside parking. They want people to get off the street. Um, However, there's another side of that that says parking on the street is actually a traffic calming measure. You, you create fr friction there in a narrower travel, travel lane that's actually safer because uh, people are driving slower. Um, the other negative perception I heard come up um, 
is the uh, negative perception of parking structures, parking garages, that they're dangerous places and they're ugly and they're blight and and so on. And and um, I think there are some cases where um, they're not um, well received and and perhaps not safe. Uh, but I have seen some really good examples. I, I think the Denver Tech Center is a good example of requiring those um, not only to be attractive, but to be safe. Um, and so I, I think along the lines of what uh, Krista and Aiden were presenting to us, that there's a public education element to um, anything that's proposed. The, the, the ways that we handle parking needs to be shared with the community and and, um, and show good examples of how it can work well. Yeah, those are all um, excellent comments um, and, and, and thought provoking and kind of will get us warmed up to really review the code as, it, as we see it. And um, yeah, I appreciate all the, all the thoughts there. I think one area our code right now is a little um, um, is a little lacking on is guest parking for residential development, particularly multifamily residential developments. We don't have guest parking requirements now, and that may be a, a something we can look at in this new code and whether to. Um, kind of anticipate not only the residents but also also guests that come in because that's all you know that's always been a an issue with with multifamily developments in particular that that it seems like our parking requirements right now don't address uh, seem to if you if you follow the the minimums it seems like there's a parking problem with with multifamily residential. So we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments before we move on to the next subject? Are we on schedule, Mike? Oh, sorry, Jason, go ahead. You're on mute. So I would encourage using the ITE parking manual as a resource when you're looking at you know, parking utilization. I think I trotted that thing out during the downtown parking discussion and um, the mentioning guest parking per the ITE manual, our multifamily standards are actually excessive. We require more parking spaces than those types of uses actually need. So huh. there may be aesthetic concerns about guest parking and people utilizing the street, but I'd encourage having a look at the parking generation manual fifth edition uh, or a, a resource on what other communities have experienced in terms of parking utilization. And however, uh, certain uh, recent writings uh, have said that even that could be more parking than is strictly necessary. So. There may be some complex factors that go into that with multifamily. Some of the developments we see have garages that are not utilized for parking, but are utilized for storage. And that can be an issue as well. But um, no, a great point, uh, Commissioner Reynolds. We'll uh, Take a look at the IT as we uh, review the code. Yeah, and Mike, more can I ask family than townhomes? Okay, yeah. and uh, thank you, and thank you for reminding us about the IT manual. That's like Shane's Bible. I need to make it one of mine too. <laughs> so, um, Sherry, I see your hand up. So, what is your question? And then I have a couple questions. For okay, you just real quick. It it's, seems like um, what Bezod said about what really going back and looking at what are we trying to accomplish? What's our objective? Because some of the things being tossed out, I mean, there's a lot of great ideas, but also some just fly in the face of the other in terms of, say, trying to accommodate parking for visitors when, you know, we're struggling with just trying to provide parking in general. And so, you know, maybe that does make sense to go back to, we don't have minimums, we have maximums. 
but it seems like, you know, we kind of have to look back at some of the core ideas and um, facts before some of those other decisions can be made. And I, I don't have a lot of recommendations around this. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a challenge. I just know that. And, and I would like to hear of any um, successful methods that are working. You know, I'm sure everything thrown out is, has been, is being utilized, has been tried. I mean, what really works? Well, and I think it's, uh, it, it, what works depends on who you talk to. Because if you talk to a lot of people in Denver, because Denver has has adopted kind of the maximum, you know, some people say it's going great and people that own cars say it's pain. It's awful. There's no place to put their car now. Um, and then you also, I mean, if you start to factor in, okay, if we're doing this and providing maximums from an environmental perspective, for example, and I'd love to get Bezad's kind of thought on this. You know, if if we're promoting environmental sustainability, the less parking we allow, doesn't that help? Isn't that more environmentally sustainable? Trying to get cars off the road and not being used. Well, you, you, you are correct, but you need to have objective as a community. You you cannot decide for whole community. Uh, my crusade is to reduce environmental impact. If the people don't want it. They are not going to do it. So look at Portland, look at Hanford, Connecticut. They did maximum minimum. They reduced their numbers and they had very large negative uh, feedbacks and large <laughs> negative uh, basically impact to the community. So I, I, I am saying the community need to have a buy-in in what they need to do. If, if it's very good idealistically to have a book that somebody published in Washington and have all these ideas and so forth. But in practice is Littleton downtown is quite different than Fort Collins, Denver, Boulder, and so forth. So you need to look at the impacts and there are ways to measure impact, either environmental impact, like noise, traffic, uh, vibration. I mean, we study all those. <laughs> I did Boulevard One, for example. So, and then see what our objective is as a community. If the objective of one or two person in the city is, okay, by doing this, we're going to reduce the car number of cars because we don't like cars. Well, you are not going to sell it to the community. It has to be an overarching a strategy that is part of the plan, that is well taught, the objective and basically goals. So I'm not saying do unlimited parking offside and so forth. Uh, putting it in the street have impacts. Put it in the driveway has an impact. Put it in the garage has an impact. But are those impacts have looked at and basically, as I say, is quantified and the cost benefit ratios is. Uh, published so everybody understand what 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 is the thinking is right now it seems to me that and no um, disrespect to anybody here but you pull a manual or something that city then they're done or Fort Collins done and said this is a good idea okay it's good but for the Littleton have you gone that extra step to do due diligence on that that, that's the point I was trying to make. I don't like cars. I, I came from a big city that I took public transit. I love public transit, but Littleton does not have a good public transit infrastructure. Thanks. Okay. okay. Jennifer, did you want to continue? Yeah, so one more. All right, so should parking incentives apply to all parts of the city? Or should they focus on just areas that we are trying to decrease the amount of cars that are there? Dan made a really interesting comment of, you know, we do have vast um, areas of our city that are auto-oriented. So should we not be as particular on having parking maximums where you absolutely have to have a car to get to them as opposed to downtown? 
light rail goes right through it. Do you have to have it? I, so would love to get your thoughts on this. And we have 10 minutes and we stay on schedule. Okay, Bezad, I think you had your hand up first. I, I think again, my opinion is the incentive, if you put it for the whole city, it loses its meaning and is basically bang for a buck. I think I will focus the incentive for the areas that we have issues and we want to correct. Uh, I live in um, areas that is a two acre site. The streets are very small. People have 16 cars, some of them, they're collectors and so forth. You are not going to incentivize those people. So uh, for, I think my opinion is focus on the areas that you really want to impact. Uh, Dave McBen, I think you had your hand up, Nick. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess my question would be, and I apologize if uh, this was covered long before I became a, a commissioner, but you know, did we research like w what is the automotive purchasing trend in the in the U.S. or in Colorado? You know, are are people buying less vehicles? Are are people, um, uh, you know? like Bezad was saying, willingly moving into, you know, alternative ways to get around things like that, you know, or are we trying to uh, lead, say, from the top down to where you're going to move in that direction if you live in Littleton, because we're going to put in maximums, whether it's around the whole city or or not, you know, and I think I agree with what Bezos said, where we have problems, I would, uh, I think we should try it, you know, try it there. And then um, have we given any thought to, you know, the last thing brick and mortar needs are obstacles to getting to their store and convenience. They're already fighting online. And I'm just curious what the business community has said about uh, balancing. Yes, we absolutely I'm in favor of less cars and being green and and everything else. You know, I guess the question is, um, have we figured out the balance or, or have we really looked at that balance? So that that's my two cents. Do you, uh, Jennifer or Mike, uh, have a response to that or so, um yeah uh, mike go ahead i know you've done some research on this and i think jason has done some research on trends and stuff so i might have you chime in too jason but go ahead mike well car buying is definitely on the way up uh during the pandemic uh lots of people purchase new cars i think uh um you know during the pandemic uh obviously uh, public transportation and transit is is uh, been dented quite a bit, but uh, that's that's kind of an unusual trend right there. Um, but I, I think there is certainly a trend toward more electric vehicles. I, you know, the types of vehicles are definitely uh, changing, and certainly there's uh, more you know, more emphasis toward electric electric vehicles by both uh, regulators and also manufacturers. Uh, I think also car sharing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, car sharing was uh, really on the rise for a, a, a long time before the pandemic. Uh, and we've had some, some interesting blips in the, uh, in the uh, statistics uh, due to the pandemic. So, you know, it's probably more valuable to look at before the pandemic what the trends were rather than during the pandemic. But uh, yeah, it seems like uh, single, you know, or vehicle uh, ownership is on the rise. Do we care whether it's an electric vehicle or a gasoline powered vehicle, or are we trying to reduce vehicles? Uh, that's an interesting, uh, long, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about what the motivations are. And, uh, you know, I think we need to find, uh, at least uh, my motivation, I suppose, if I have a motivation, is to, is to find a good balance between land use and uh, automobile use. I, I don't, 
you know, I don't have any desire to tell people what to buy or, <laughs> or what to own or anything like that. I have no desire at all about that. Uh, um, or, or how to get around really. I, um, however, we, we need to strike the right balance of, uh, of the built environment and what is going to be used for a building, what's going to be used for, um, open space such as, you know, greenery and what's going to be used for, um, parking. So, to me, that seems like the uh, what my objective would be is to find some sort of balance. I, I don't think we need to do a lot of social engineering here myself. Uh, uh, I'm actually a car guy. So <laughs> I sort of like cars. <laughs> I own old. Uh, I was going to say, Mike, how many cars yeah. do you own? <laughs> uh, yeah, too many. <laughs> You also have two drivers. Uh, you also have four drivers. Your address so we can put it in the zoning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Craig, can I call on Jason? Because I, I know he's. Yeah. I hate to put you on the spot, Jason, but. She thinks. <laughs> so, this won't directly address the question, but I, I think of it as kind of a land utilization. Uh, thing and how efficiently are we using the land that is available for development? I'm looking at an aerial photograph of South Bridge Plaza with the Safeway there at Mineral and Broadway. And if you look at the Google Maps aerial, there's a vast swath of the parking lot that is just not being used. And that's space that could be devoted to gathering spaces, to green space, to maybe additional shopping that generates sales tax for the city that provides ex, you know valuable experiences for people who live here. So you know I think you know I tend to approach parking not from a, a cars are bad but from a perspective that it's an inefficient way to use the land that is available to us. And there's you know studies that show and this may change with electrification but you know the Kind of the research shows that you know higher parking requirements essentially subsidize cars because you're you know incurred you're like hey look at all these free spaces they can increase traffic congestion with internal combustion engines and people circling the block downtown looking for a parking spot that's uh, increasing pollution um, and another factor is actually cost of housing uh, you know a parking space plus the drive aisle next to it. Uh, that's the 1.5 uh, parking spaces required for the typical one bedroom apartment. That's 488 square feet. That's a studio apartment there that you're devoting to a car rather than a person. Uh, putting back on kind of commercial, you know, just maximums can, can help with commercial design. It can help with some of the Areas um, and the only time I have ever needed to walk very far for a parking spot is trying to see a movie at the height of summer movie season during the Paris street market at Aspen Grove. I had to park the light, walk an extra 500 feet. Uh, my heart thanked me, although. Uh, my brain did not because I was almost late for the movie. But yeah, you know, there's uh, generally the you know, the developers kind of know how the parking operates. But you, setting that maximum guardrail provides opportunities for actually you know additional sales tax base, additional gathering space, additional quality of life in those shopping centers. Because yeah, just have a look at that aerial of Southbridge Plaza. There's a lot of wasted space there. Well, thanks for your patience, everybody. Bruce, I know you had your hand up. I don't know if you want to. I, I'm Jason and and Bezad and and Mike had really outstanding synopses of uh, anything I was going to add in. So uh, I'll defer to them. Okay. And David Bolt, I I know you had your hand up before. Did you want to add anything? <laughs> Can't hear you. Sorry, there I just didn't want to keep adding the same uh, the, the same sentiments. Everybody kind of had uh, said what I was going to say. So, okay. 
All right. Thanks. So with that, uh, any closing comments or you want to move on to the uh, downtown? Great discussion. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, Jennifer, do you want me to try and plow through this or do you want to tackle this one? I'm at half battery, so I'm not doing bad. <laughs> I'd say go, go ahead, Mike. Let's see, okay. let's see what we can get done. The race right, against the battery. Good. Go. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, as, you, as we t discussed earlier, we adopted the, the downtown code uh, earlier, uh, or uh, last year. And the chance to sort of implement this downtown code in the past, uh, I guess it's been about uh, eight or nine months. And it's been really interesting. Uh, you know, you, uh, you never quite know exactly how a code is going to operate until you put it in place. Uh, we have had the opportunity to have uh, a couple of pre-applications and, a, and a, a development case that have gone in in the downtown area and use the, the new code. And we've been learning some things from that. Uh, we did, uh, the downtown code works. We, we, uh, we've had at least uh, one uh, potentially successful uh, development downtown under the new code. But uh, there are some, some areas that probably need to be tweaked. And we'll probably, you know, this will be a, a common discussion over the next few years is tweaks. And what we've, uh, what we've discovered from some of our pre-applications is that we need to define things a little bit more clearly. And, and the ULUC is going to have a whole new section of definitions that uh, should really help us. But, um, you know, we, we need to define the build to zone a little bit uh, um, more carefully, I think. Not more carefully, just a, a, a more clear definition of what the build to zone is. Uh, hardscaping is, is something we're going to look at uh, adding uh, for definitions. A lot coverage. Um, open space, public and private, uh, tree canopy, and a, a building wing uh, is kind of an interesting concept that we really hadn't anticipated in this, uh, in this downtown code adventure uh, that we really probably need to address. What, uh, uh, it, it seems to be obvious what a building wing could be, but uh, we probably need to address how that works with the, with the code requirements. Um, also, we need to uh, have a, we discovered it's probably a good idea to have a, a maximum uh, hardscaping um, uh, provision. And uh, to clarify how, how these porches work uh, with the front facade and the, the build to zone and also the, the step back requirements of the upper story. Um, that relationship has been a little bit interesting in some of the residential, uh, proposals that we've seen, um, a rather unpleasant discovery, uh, <laughs> in the, uh, in the code was that a, um, dr driveway requirements, I think are limited to 12 feet and really you can't put a, a double car garage, even on the side of a of a building with a, with a requirement like that. Um, and that was, yeah, something that just kind of came out of the blue at us. Uh, initially we did see a, a 12 foot driveway width requirement. We thought, Oh, that's great, but it doesn't really work in some cases. And we'll show you an example uh, of that on the next slide. But uh, we also have a few technical corrections to do things that, I think we're kind of unintended uh, that kind of, I, I got into the code. I, I, you know, there's been a, it's been a, a fast and furious over the last several months, uh, you know, doing code revisions and looking at new codes. There is a, uh, a footnote in the land use table that uh, just doesn't make a lot of sense. We're not quite sure 
where that came from or how it got into the code, but there is a, um, a footnote we need to correct. And also uh, one sentence of the code seems to indicate that, that uh, setbacks downtown are measured from the curb, not the property line, which is really probably I would, I would classify that as more of a mistake than a, um, you know, something that had intent to it. So I can show you one of the uh, pre-apps that we've had in the, in the last few months. This is a, a, a duplex, a proposed duplex on a corner lot. And uh, the property owner read through the whole downtown code and uh, came up with a design. This, this was a pre-application design. This didn't, there were some significant issues with, uh, with this uh, particular development and, and they can be addressed, but um, uh, here you can see on the, the, you know, the front of the house is toward the, uh, the right on that upper illustration of the elevation. And that would be the front of the house. The side is where you'd see that, that garage door uh, for, the, for the, uh, the front unit. And that's, uh, if you look at the, uh, the site plan, uh, you can see the, the driveway going up to the side street. And <laughs> how if we had a 12-foot wide uh, uh, requirement for that driveway width, they just can't do it. Uh, you, know, you, you don't have enough room to uh, to pull into the garage. It seems like our engineers were were kind of scratching our heads at that one. Um, the the step back issue along the front. I think the applicant might be able to address that. Uh, but uh, you know, we also discovered that that issue with the. Uh, with the building setback being required from the curb uh, with this particular development. And uh, really, uh, we didn't have an issue with open space on this particular one, but uh, um, the detached garage, which you can barely tell is detached here, uh, became sort of an issue. We do have a requirement that it be at least five feet from the principal structure. Um, but the setback for that is something we've got to address with the with the new code. Uh, right now, it's a twenty foot setback from the alley, so that uh, caused some uh, some real head scratching in the code. We may be able to uh, um, tweak a few things in the in the regulations to help us navigate some of these issues. Um, and let's see. Oh, definitions. Uh, uh, there, you, you know, this is all kind of uh, a language that we're looking at. It's, you know, we, um, I don't know if this will make it into the draft or not, but uh, we've got some ideas for, for hardscaping, tree canopy, and, and wing uh, that are, uh, we're looking at right now. Um, I, I think where wing became an issue. Uh, on that previous slide, uh, Jennifer, the the front elevation, uh, you have a a build, uh, you know, a uh, a minimum setback, and then a build to zone. So uh, I believe the minimum setback is uh, ten feet, and the build to is twenty feet. So the front facade of this building most of it has between oh here my battery low uh i may have to call in jen do you want to continue yes i take myself off mute okay so we're, sorry about that yeah you want to switch to phone yeah uh, yeah i will try that okay and i have mike has an excellent explanation of the build two zone but we're really trying to to flush that out and it has to do with with the step back the step back what can go in between those two um so we're really trying to define that and clarify that because that really um we got stuck on it as staff uh, each staff member honestly had a different interpretation of it 
Um, and then the applicant had a different interpretation. So we're really trying to nail down what that is and make that as, as clear as possible. I do, I'm, I'll have Mike go on the, back to the build two zone, but on the hardscaping, a big thing that we found on the hardscaping, um, and again, this is really in response to, to some of the concerns that were expressed at Planning Commission as well as City Council of when we have an open space requirement, we wanna make sure that it's not completely a hardscape if we're allowing that as an open space amenity. So really kind of adding that that 20%. So are we comfortable with, you know, if you have a 35% open space requirement thing, 20% of it could be hardscaping, but the rest of it needs to be green. Um, so just what are we comfortable with there? Um, and then also on tree canopy, because we were talking about tree plantings and we weren't taking into account the full growth um, and how that basically would cut, take up a significant amount more space um, than just the planting itself and how we take that into account. And hang on, I wanna, so what we're asking you is, are we missing, is there something that you have come across now that we have had the downtown um, adopted here for a couple months? And then um, a lot of the character aspects that we put into the building design, do we wanna carry that same level of detail into the rest of the city for building design types? Um, and then when we're talking about historic preservation, um, believe it or not, now um, historically on the federal level, basically any property over 40 years old um, is, can be considered to become a historic property. And would we want um, basically properties in the city to be identified um, and have to go through a different process on that? So, questions on this? Just a question and, on the uh, historic, uh, the, that was recently changed. I always thought it was 50 years to be considered yeah. historic. So it's 50 to be considered historic, and now they're saying if anything's over 40, it needs to be kind of put on basically like a watch list. So any building that built 90, 1980 and before, so that means 90% of them just yeah. missed right. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of my thought. I'm like, oh, I think that's kind of overreaching. And like, would we really want to do that? Or would we want to limit it to, all right, if we have designated historic districts, so, you know, we're going to talk about expanding possibly the Main Street historic, Main Street historic district. Hang on. Speaking of dead batteries, that just died. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, would we want to tie it to just a district or, you know, identify, I know HPB has gone through an exercise of identifying throughout the city, our historic assets or potential historic assets. So limiting it to that, um, again, just concepts at this point, but looking for feedback. Could you put the questions back up again that you yeah. were asking us to answer? Um, so what is missing? Um, I guess my reaction to that is you guys have obviously seen the applications. We haven't. So it's kind of hard for me, at least, to you know identify that anything's missing. I think those are some um, interesting unanticipated consequences that you could expect with anything. but. Um, yeah, however we can help with that. Any uh, conversation would be great. Um, and then, I'm sorry, if you just put that up there again, I oh, didn't whoops. see the, the second, third questions. So the downtown character requirements. And I would more like the specific building articulation. The level of detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the 40 year old question. Okay, thanks. You can put the, the gallery view back up again. Um, any thoughts or questions from the commission? Bruce? 
I think the with respect to the downtown guidelines or the downtown standards and, and the 40 year old buildings, I mean it's a it's what we said on some on the parking, it's it's a balance issue. I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't be comfortable with just carte blanche. I think there are some areas of the community where, yeah, some standards would would be a good idea. I don't, I think just saying any building over 40 years old is subject to HPB review is, I think that's, I think that's an over rotation. Um, but I think, I, pardon me, I'm sorry. But I do, I, you know, I, I, I think picking and choosing where appropriate, there's, there can be some applications, but I don't think it's appropriate to just say all of this stuff applies to the entire community. Thank you. Besa, I think you were next. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Bruce. I think uh, basically downtown have its own characteristic or the part of the Richardson and community have different um, characteristic. So by just applying the uh, um, same standards, I, I think we are, we are just you know, copy and pasting is not gonna address those issues. The historical uh, building is not only the age, it has to have certain, if you look at the federal guidelines, there's a uh, grading, there is characteristic, there is type of buildings and so forth. So just um, saying anything 40 years, uh, need to go through this review, I, I think is, uh, to me, is a little bit um, stupid, to put it mildly. <laughs> 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 so, you know, it's just creating more uh, progress for the city and everybody. So I, I disagree with that. Thank you. Okay, there's Sherry and then uh, David. Agree, agree, disagree. No, no, never mind. Um, and what is missing, my only comment on that, I think, is that we would look to staff to come back to us just the way you did tonight and say, now that we're practicing these things, we're finding that this doesn't work, that doesn't work. And if you have obviously a recommendation to how to fix it, that would be most helpful. And then if you need our input, we could give that to you. But it seems that. Um, that would be difficult for us to determine without those things being brought to our attention. So I think you're doing that right. Uh, secondly, downtown, I agree with what was said. We can't have a one size fits all. It just doesn't make sense. Historic buildings, what Basog was saying, almost everything in our whole city would be historic because our housing stock is aging. Everything is aging. I mean, my home is now almost 40 years old, I, you know. Um, so it does make sense, but um, the only the only thing I didn't I don't think I heard mentioned is if there's something architecturally significant or style or you know something like that that makes a lot of sense. And uh, what that age cutoff is, I don't know, but forty seems awful young, especially the older we get. <laughs> so those are my comments. Okay, thank you. I can agree more. <laughs> yeah. David and then Jason. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess I agree to some extent with uh, everybody on the historical uh, significance. I think I would agree with the 40 years, except that yeah, I, I think we need to have some other criteria and maybe do an audit of uh, properties that uh, you know, at different age levels, maybe 40, 50 and beyond that have, um, uh, that meet other criteria of, of the federal requirements for historical properties and, you know, maybe have a list that it, it can't be, uh, I mean, maybe it's, it'll be a big list, but I, I don't really think so. Um, and then uh, I, I also agree that we can't just spread regulations around the city uh, without having some sort of, um, you know, 
I guess, reasoning behind it. I think that uh, maybe some regulations make sense to uh, s- spread on throughout the city, but I don't think we can just say extend extend them all to the rest of the city. Uh, downtown is definitely a unique area and uh, should have some unique rules and regs. Thanks. Okay, thank you, David. Jason? lowered the hand. Yeah, I think you know, I agree with the, the comments on the, the 40 years. Um, that alone is probably not sufficient. Uh, piece of trivia, the, the little town building there just west of Sycamore was built in 1985. So it's almost there. Uh, the, that's at 2329 West Main. Um, on the you know promulgation of standards from the downtown outside of downtown, there are some that could be appropriate given the context of the neighborhood. Uh, there's several areas of the Progress Park neighborhood, for example, that are alley loaded, uh, built in the 50s. Very few, uh, well, not very few, but much fewer curb cuts for wide driveways than you see in other areas of the city. And currently, to my knowledge, there's not a standard that would prevent me from building a three-car garage and a really wide driveway in front of my home that would be really out of character from the neighborhood. And in fact, you can see that uh, just south of Powers and Detura. Uh, One home was built in the last couple of years with an alley-loaded garage. The one across the street, a very nice home, would look great in South Park or Highlands Ranch. Big old two-car garage with a wide driveway, you know, eating up a big chunk of the pedestrian space. So there's there's probably some areas of uh, the city that could benefit from some of the design standards that are in downtown. But as people have said, it's not one size fits all. Right? And this wouldn't necessarily apply to other neighborhoods in the city, but you know, I'm thinking mainly of the alley loaded neighborhoods that you find in Progress Park. I guess I, I will agree with uh, several of the commissioners that talked about how Um, what we did for the downtown area can be extended to the rest of the city and the ULUC. And I know we spent a lot of time, you know, focusing on downtown. And part of that was, um, it was kind of new to us, this this approach of of a little bit more of a form-based, a little less of a Euclidean uh, uh, type of code approach. Um, But I think Part of the unintended consequences in, in my observation is that it's a little complicated and it, it may be a little bit too detailed, um, trying to you know accomplish more than you really can in a, in a land use code. And so my thought in extending it to the rest of the city is uh, it be kept as simple as possible, but also you know really establish some um, good sort of guardrails. So and and also be in a, in a language that um, individual landowners and uh, developers that are interested really understand um, the implications so it doesn't get too wonky. <laughs> um, and I think there's a little bit of wonkiness here that is, is led to some of these um, unintended consequences. You know, I think of something like tree canopy definition. I think a lot of it can be done with the definitions and I'm glad that there's a focus on that with the ULUC. Um, the tree canopy, I mean, if you try to describe it based on a future condition of a tree that's planted, you know, in somebody's yard, um, an arborist could come in and say, well, you know, it's going to get this big or it's going to get that big. You know, how do you define the, the canopy? And there are formulas that city foresters use. But if it was kept fairly simple in that, you know, there's a, a canopy tree that's given, you know, a certain amount of credit for a canopy and then there's an ornamental tree that's maybe a different uh, size and maybe there's three different types of trees or something keep it simple instead of you know opening it up to formulas and you know in- engineering and so on so um but um you know i think it's a good template uh, for expanding through the city i think we just need to keep it as simple straightforward and le- you know legible to common folks that are using it every day as possible. And that is definitely something as, you know, we're reviewing different sections that we're getting, we're keeping in mind of, you know, can the average person read this and understand it and not have to ask 
a, a bunch of questions or, you know, minimizing the room for interpretation, which always makes Reed, Reed very happy when it's very clear <laughs> what needs to be done. So, um, okay. And we'll have, um, yeah, I mean, the main reason that we brought this before you was a, a realization that we are going to have to make adjustments and we're actually working on some language of, of what it looks like, you know, as we, as we adopt the code and we're gonna have, I don't even know if we call it a grace period read, of we're, we're going to come across things and, you know, can we approve things administratively as we change things? So that's language that we're working on um, as well. I was going to ask, what is the timeline for making those adjustments in the downtown code? Would that go then parallel with the ULUC citywide or? Yeah, I mean, so so some of these um, that we just talked about tonight have started to be have been integrated into the the draft that you all will see in June. Um, so as we have found them between time of adoption back, what was that? December, January, um, <laughs> um, to now, we are feeding those to KKC. So they can make those changes. So the the draft that you'll see will reflect um, to the the items that we found so far. Okay. Well, thank you for that presentation, Jennifer. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Reed, uh, do you have anything to to add? Nope. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess. Um, we will um, we can close the meeting. Um, Jennifer, did you have any updates for um, next meetings or? Yes. So can you guys see my screen? I sure can. Okay. So we've had a few schedule adjustments. I can get this to go from the current slide. There we go. Now you guys can probably read that. Okay. Um, so tomorrow night, it is not a PC night and it doesn't require you to be on camera or anything, but I do encourage you guys to tune into the city council study session. Um, like I had mentioned before, they are going to be, um, Brett um, is, is actually going to be in person briefing council on the kind of project, the ULUC project and where we are with that and what to expect and is going to be asking council some some questions um, about direction and just kind of a reminder of why we are doing the ULUC. So I think that would be great to turn into. And the other part of that study session is discussing downtown, um, which is goal four of, of council goals. So if you have a chance to tune into that tomorrow night, great. If not, I encourage you at some point to do that. If you actually watch it afterwards, remember you can speed it up so you can do it in half the time. Um, <laughs> So that is an option. Um, I may or may not have used that on occasion. Um, so, and then on May 24th, um, we will actually have a session where we're going to introduce you to ENCODE. Um, so I don't know if any of you have, have seen in the last few days, we actually have a new look to the city code. So if you go online and click city code, um, it looks very different. It is now in our new format, the ENCODE format. Um, and that is the format that the new unified land use code will be integrated into. So we're going to show you how to use that and how to make comments um, on it on the draft when it comes out. And we're also going to have some of our staff planners um, talk about what we've been doing in terms of outreach and what we're going to be doing this summer. For those of you that haven't yet, um, I encourage you to go to the EnvisionLittleton.org site, and we have some videos, short videos, um, on different topics such as um, economy and mobility, and we will have one on housing if it's not up there already. Um, and then there's a short survey um, that goes with each of those. So I think in total, it'll take you 10 minutes. Um, so I encourage you guys to go and do that and share that link with, with your friends. Um, so they can give us input too. And then uh, June 14th, we'll have a study session with the Historical Preservation Board. 
um, and we'll talk about the historic district um, application that's going to be going in front of council to expand expand the main street historic district to also include properties fronting Alamo. Um, and then June 28th, we'll be meeting with the housing task force um, and we'll discuss um, kind of the housing focused aspects of the draft code because by then we will have it. Um, and then July 12th and 26th, we'll be focused on walking through the code. So no summer vacation for you all, sorry. <laughs> And the expectation is still that the uh, draft would be released on June 7? Yes. That is our driving force at the moment. OK, okay. well, great. Well, any um, uh, comments or updates from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the meeting. Thank you for keeping it on track and schedule. Great conversation. Yes, thank you very much for the input. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks very much to staff. Uh, great, great job. Yep. Thanks. Yep. All right, thank we you. all have a good night. Thanks. Good night. Bye. All right, bye.